Hello, my name is Simon Tillotson and um, I'm preparing a Christmas message that I'm going to give at All Saints on Christmas Eve. But I thought it might be good, and on Christmas Day of course, but I thought it might be good just to say a few words about it for those of you who follow me on Facebook or who visit our website but don't actually come to the church services um, over Christmas. As I realise a lot of people go away for Christmas and quite a few people don't come to church but are interested in spiritual things. One of the things I've been studying um, this year has been philosophy in my free time. I've read quite a lot about the different philosophers of the 17th and 18th century, the 16th century. Uh, and one of the things that they were interested in, in was what could be proven, what can be proven. Can even existence be proven? Can matter be proven? And through these different arguments that they had, they, many of them came to the conclusion that you couldn't prove the existence of God. Remember, in the medieval period, God's existence had been taken as a uh, an automatic reality for many people, that people had been taught that, that God existed and not to doubt him. And the philosophers in the 17th and 18th and 19th century did their very best, quite intelligently, to dismantle that whole approach and to say that you couldn't prove God's existence and therefore God didn't exist or doesn't exist. And of course we've seen people like Richard Dawkins in the last 10 years um, and other philosophers add to that argument by looking at the world of suffering around us and saying if God did exist how can he allow the world to be as it is. Um, I think some of these thoughts that God can't be proven, that there is suffering in the world, those those two thoughts in particular seem to me to be the, the two most popular ways of thinking amongst young people and people in my age group, 30s, 40s, 50s in Britain today and 60s as well, people in their 60s. Many, of, many people in that generation um, no longer believe in God and think that um, religious people are basically deluded and um, that's the reality that the church is living with we have got a huge struggle to get out our message that there is a god and that we believe in spirituality and we believe in prayer and the existence of life beyond death and so on so what do i say um, to this context in which i find myself I think the first thing I'd like to say is that the provability, if there is such a word, there probably isn't, but the ability to prove God's existence isn't for me an issue um, because if God's existence could be proved, our free will would automatically be taken away from us. Um, if you can prove that there is a divine being watching you and um, telling you what to do and following your every step, and you've had no choice about that belief, you've no, had no choice about that um, religious mindset, it's been just given to you without any freedom to respond, it becomes something oppressive. And we know that because when um, children in certain cultures have been told to believe, you must believe in God, um, you must go to church, um, they've often responded in an aggressive way in the end. Uh, similarly, uh, in some cultures where religion is forced down people's throats, um, in some cases it works, but a lot of the time people are resentful at the end of the day, especially if they've been influenced by Western culture. So any world in which God's existence is imposed from, a, from an authoritarian position um, is for me wrong. Um, it, God has to be something that we discover for ourselves, that we choose to seek and search for in our own autonomy, in our own freedom. And that's precisely what Christianity is. People who come to faith are always, I would say, always people who have made steps in that direction, either through prayer, through study, through reading, through questioning. And then at a certain point in that search, they have 
felt something or, or experienced something uh, that has made them believers. But there's always been that element of free choice. There are, of course, many people who come to faith as children, and you could argue that they were forced into it by their upbringing. But actually, um, we know that many, many people are, are become ch uh, believers as children and then lose their faith. Um, so I think those who become believers as children still make this decision of their own mind to continue on that journey and to let that faith grow and their freedom is not taken away from them. So a scientifically provable God would not necessarily be a good thing because it would take away our free will. And what I think my God believes in is my freedom to choose, to respond to him, to respond to Christ's love, to um, follow that. A, a second issue, as I've said before in this, is suffering. People say, how can um, God exist if there's a world of suffering around us? Now, this is, again is a, a difficult area, but uh, if you're going to judge, um, say, a restaurant or a hotel um, for what it is, you need to actually go into the restaurant and say, yeah, this food's not very good, or this food is very good, or this hotel's got a nice atmosphere, I like it very much. Or if you were going to judge a church, you'd want to actually go to the church and say, yes, I think the the, vic the vicar preaches a reasonable sermon or doesn't preach a reasonable sermon or or whatever it might be. And it's the same with Christianity. If you're going to judge Christianity uh, on the issue of suffering, you have to judge Christianity as it actually is, not as it's been presented by the Victorian era or by other people, other cultures. Because if you actually look at Christianity as it actually is, you'll see that it's full of suffering, full full to the brink, brim with suffering. Um, you know, Jesus is born in a, in a cow shed in a manger uh, because there's no room in the inn and all of the firstborn children in Bethlehem are murdered at the same time. Shortly after that Jesus goes into Egypt as a refugee. Um, he then comes back, grows up as a, uh, a carpenter uh, in his adult life and then becomes an itinerant preacher, an evangelist, miracle worker, healer before being rejected by his friends and disciples and put on a cross and crucified. Yes, Christians believe he rose from the dead, but then look at his followers, John the Baptist, um, second to Jesus in preeminence in the Gospels, is beheaded. Uh, St. Peter, um, all Christian tradition believes, and there's fairly good testimony of it, is crucified upside down. St. Paul is killed by the Romans. Many of the early followers of Christ are killed and die, probably in their 20s or 30s. So this is a, a, a Christian movement that really dies um, in its tracks. Many people are killed. Um, you open the Book of Saints from the last 2,000 years and you'll read page after page of famous Christians, Christians who have been murdered or killed for their faith or have died in difficult circumstances. And so it's quite clear that Christianity doesn't protect believers from the world of suffering. Rather, it is um, a belief, Christianity is a belief that the world to come is a spiritual world where all evil will be overcome and well, where suffering will end. And to become a believer in Christ is to experience the Holy Spirit and to enter into that experience of the life to come now, that life um, which knows no end, where there is no suffering or pain. Now, people who come to faith in Christ experience this new life, which comes from the Spirit. And I've met many of them in my time as a Christian. I, I came to a strong faith in Israel nearly... Uh, 30 years ago, about 29 years ago now. And I, I've met many people who've, who I've seen in terrible situations, in paralysed, in, in hospital beds, or, or bereaved, or very depressed, or 
whatever it may be, and yet they've managed to encounter God um, and Jesus in their suffering. And yeah, we can get angry with God and we can say, why do you allow this and why do you allow that? And if we do that, we are, we are joined by the psalmist who, who asks the same questions. But the experience of believers is that the suffering is often the thing that actually brings us to faith. Of course, Freud and other people said that uh, this coming to faith is a psychological delusion or a crutch that makes us feel better. But actually, I think uh, most Christians would say once they've actually come to faith, it's then that their life gets a lot harder. They have to start being honest and follow uh, the narrow way that Jesus calls us to walk in. And it's not an easy option by any means. So the revelation of God and the suffering of God and the suffering of the Christian world are two key issues that we find at Christmas because, of course, Jesus is born in suffering and he is born into a world which doesn't force itself into our lives. He, he is born into a faith or reveals a faith, I should say, which taps gently at the human heart and says, will you, will you follow me? Will you believe in me? Will you discover me? And that's what Christmas is all about. A, a baby in a manger 2,000 years ago, and yet someone who went on to transform his culture and the world. 